In this week's show, we travel to Nebraska to see a really weird statue and a bunch of pioneering statues. We discuss the likes and dislikes of our new Ram 3500. The other thing that this truck came with that I never even thought of until after we bought it, visit one of the oldest highways in America and see a roadside attraction that claims to be the biggest. Good morning, kids. Where are we at, Tony Tao? We are in Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska. Why We're are we in Nebraska? Uh, well, we had to come up to Nebraska because we may wind up having a job out here outside of Omaha. We're going to meet with the company on Friday of this week to see if we can help them out. And how did this job come about, Tony Tao? A uh, gentleman named Matt that I went to high school with reached out to us. <laughs> we see enough. <laughs> yeah, her, so Tony's friend from high school, Matt, was watching our YouTube stuff and he reached out to us and said, hey, we might need some videos done. Are you guys interested? And so now we're gonna meet with them on Friday. We got in here on Thursday. Thursday. We got in here, well, you go ahead and tell the story. Jeez, we got in here the day after one of the worst storms that Omaha, Nebraska has had. Trees are down, power is out. Um, people said they'd never seen anything like it. I went to the grocery store yesterday and a gentleman said he was, for the first time he was, he was uh, feared for his life. <laughs> Lights were out, there was there was trees down all over the place. We got here into the park and there was a bunch of trees down in the park. Actually, I'll show you, there's a tree right behind our, uh, our fifth wheel that they haven't cleaned up yet, but you can see how it's just was pretty much snapped in half. So yeah, it was kind of a crazy approach into Omaha. Yeah. All right, but we've got some stuff that we need to get done done. Today we're going to go adventuring. Where are we going to adventure, Tony Tao? To the riverfront in downtown Omaha. Riverfronts seem to be a thing for us, huh? I like riverfronts. I do too. I do too. If you wind up in a town that has like a riverfront part, just go there. It's we nice. did the one we did the one in Spokane, which I will link here or here. I can never remember which side it, I just it like comes up. Friends. All right, so uh, we're heading to Omaha to check some stuff out. Come join us and see where we wind up. On our way to the riverfront, we got a bit turned around and wound up on the Council Bluff side where we found Looking Up. It's a 35 foot tall statue made from crushed aluminum foil, roasting pans, and baking tins. The original sculpture was displayed here for a year before being sold to a collector, but the city ordered up this replacement. Once we got our bearings and had Omaha back in our sights, we headed back over the Missouri River. We stumbled on to Pioneer Courage Park and had to take a look. It features a sculpture series that pays homage to the more than 600,000 people that crossed Nebraska over a 20 year period in the mid 1800s. Well, hi kids. Today I wanna to talk a little bit about our Ram truck uh, that we use to pull our Brinkley. Welcome to the inside of the Brinkley. I was planning to shoot this outside um, next to the truck, but of course, as soon as you plan that, it becomes leaf blower day uh, here in the RV park. Tony Tao's over here doing some dishes. Smile, Tony Tao. Lean in, there you go. She's over here doing some dishes, so you'll see her some of that noise too. You know, regular, uh, regular RV life. First, when we bought the Brinkley, we did have to upgrade our truck. Prior to this truck, we had a three quarter ton Chevy. We had all kinds of issues with the Chevy, specifically with the trailer brakes. I'll link that up here so that you can check that out if you're interested. 
The one thing we did learn, if you are going to buy a truck to pull a trailer, whether it's a travel trailer or it's a fifth wheel, do yourself a favor and just go buy a one ton. We didn't do that. So in the course of a year, we went from a half ton to a three quarter ton to a one ton. And it was a costly mistake. When we did upgrade to our one ton, we went from the Chevy, we moved back to Rams. We'd had multiple Rams in the past, really, really loved them, didn't have any problems with them. So, and after having the problems we had with the Chevy, uh, we decided we were going to move back to a Ram. So what are the specs on our truck? So the first thing that we knew we wanted was a long bed. Uh, since we do run a video production company, we need to haul gear around and we wanted that long bed for that. On top of the long bed, we knew we were gonna go with a Gen Y gooseneck hitch. So we made sure that we had a puck system in the back of the truck so that we could just drop the ball in, drop the D-rings for the chains and be ready to haul. We also wanted a crew cab, just because every once in a while, if we have to take somebody with us, there's room in the back. Uh, we knew from having previous Rams that the back seat on Rams is huge. I mean, I'm 6'4", and I still have tons of leg room in the back of the Ram. As far as powertrain specs, we wanted to move from a gas to a diesel, specifically the Cummins high output 6.7 liter diesel. Part of the reason for that was pulling power because we were going from a, a 7,000 pound trailer to a 15,000 pound trailer. So I wanted that extra pulling power, but more important than that, I wanted the exhaust brake. We do a lot of of traveling in the west so we're up on mountain roads and I wanted that exhaust break for getting us down those mountain roads. We also wanted the Ison transmission on it basically because of reading a lot of stuff about how reliable that transmission was. The last thing that we wanted was we wanted a single rear wheel. We didn't want a dually. And part of this is because of our video production company. There's times when we do jobs in city centers, like last year we were in Cincinnati, we were also in Boston. If you've ever driven in towns like that, you know that getting a dually around one of those towns is just a horrible idea. So we've had the truck for almost a year now. We're filming this at the end of September, so October, November. So we've had it for 10 months, almost a year. We have I believe about 13,000 miles on it. I'll check and if I'm wrong, I'll just put it on screen. So with that in mind, let's talk about our likes and dislikes with the Ram 3500. Let's start with dislikes because there's really not that many of them. Um, the first dislike is the turning radius. Rams are notorious for having the turning radius of a modern aircraft carrier. If you're gonna do a U-turn, you basically need three lanes to work with uh, to make that U-turn. So we don't make a lot of U-turns in the Ram. The Ison transmission. One thing about the Ison transmission is Every once in a while, it can throw a really, really hard shift. The first time that that happened, it scared the hell out of me. So I started to do, do some research and, and what I have learned is that's just the Ison transmission. It's not hurting anything, it's not doing any damage. It just every once in a while throws a really, really hard shift. The big screen on the dash, we've got the big 12 inch vertical screen. I will say this, the vertical screen is much better than the horizontal screen that we had in our, our Chevy truck because the vertical screen, if you think about it, when you're using it for navigation, it just makes more sense to have it vertical because you can then see farther ahead of your, of your path on, on the GPS screen. But the vertical screen, the, the, the whole infotainment system as a whole has some issues. Um, we've had problems with it just randomly deciding it doesn't want to connect to CarPlay on your phone. We have yet to figure out how to solve that problem when it happens. And then the next time you get in the truck, 
it's fine. It hooks right up. So I don't know. I don't know what's causing that. If you've figured out a solution for it and you have a RAM, let me know in the comments below what that solution is. Uh, the other thing with the infotainment system, we have had issues where the, uh, the volume knob just decides it's not going to work. Now there is a way to go into the screen and get to separate volume controls on the screen. And we've used that to increase the volume. Sometimes if we just change the channel on, on our Sirius XM, the volume will start working again. But we have had issues with the volume knob itself just deciding it's not going to work. This next dislike, this isn't really a RAM thing. This is more of a diesel thing. This is the first time that we have owned a diesel rig and the cost of maintenance on the diesel rig is just a heck of a lot more expensive. So let me give you an example. The last oil change that we did, uh, we also had to change the fuel filters. There's two fuel filters on this engine and it wound up to be a total cost of $700 to do the oil and fuel filter change. Tony, can you think of any other dislikes? Tony's sitting right over here. The length. Oh, <laughs> yeah, with the long bed, it is a long truck. So you're going to wind up parking out in the back of parking lots, kind of like you would do with a dually, um, because a lot of times parking spaces aren't long enough, so you're gonna wind up taking up two. I mean, you can be a jerk and take up two towards the front of the parking lot, we're not that kind of, we're those kind of people. So if we have to park and take up two spots, we're gonna park kind of out in the back. So the length is, it is a long truck. On the other hand, it goes through drive-throughs fine. I haven't had a problem with going through any drive-through with that truck, even though it's super long. So. So it makes me walk farther into the store, but I can get my fast food so I remain fat. <laughs> okay, so is that it for dislikes? No, I love the truck. Okay, well, we're gonna get on, we're gonna move on to likes. Okay, okay so here's what I have for likes. The Ram is way, way, way more comfortable to drive than the Chevy was. There's just more room in the cab. Now, you also take this comment with a grain of salt because I'm not a petite individual. I am six foot four and about 340. Um, so I take up a lot of space and the Ram allows that space. So it's way more comfortable to drive in. Um, it has much better forward visibility than our Chevy did. The Chevy had this great big square hood and trying to see over the front corners of the hood was, was difficult at best. The Ram, just the way the hood is designed, it kind of slopes down on the edges so you can see better um, off the edges of that hood. The other thing that I didn't even realize Ram had until we bought the Chevy was with the Ram at night, if you start to make a turn, there is a light that will come on to the, to the front side of where you're turning. Does that make sense? If I turn to the right, it illuminates the front right so I can see what I'm turning into. Either way I'm turning, I can see what I'm turning into. That I didn't even realize until after we bought the Chevy and I absolutely missed that when we had the Chevy. I now have it back. The diesel engine. The diesel engine is a huge like for me, even though it costs more, um, because, because of the pulling power and, as I mentioned before, because of the exhaust brake. The Ram exhaust brake is bloody brilliant. I just basically get the truck in the gear that the ex exhaust brake will hold it in, and coming down long, steep grades, I never have to touch the brake. It might actually offset the cost of more maintenance on oil changes by having less maintenance on brake replacements because I never touch the brakes in this thing. Even coming up to a light, I let the exhaust brake slow everything down. I don't even touch the brakes till the last minute. And then a couple of other things that, that just happened to be on this truck that wasn't something that was a requirement, but I am so glad they're on this truck because they've been hugely helpful. 
Uh, the first is airbags. This truck came with auto leveling airbags. There's two settings on these airbags. One's higher and one's lower. We run in the lower setting because since we have the Gen Y hitch, the Gen Y hitch tends to tow a little nose high. On top of that, we use the B&W ball, um, and the B&W ball sits a couple inches higher than other balls, so that added to the nose high towing. But with these two different heights that I can get out of the airbags, I run it on the lower height. I'm still a touch nose high, but it, but it helped a lot with that. The other thing that this truck came with that I never even thought of until after we bought it is a 50 gallon fuel tank. I will never own a truck with a smaller fuel tank again, especially for pulling a fifth wheel. We've had this rig for almost a year now. I, there has been one time, only one time, that I have had to pull the truck and trailer uh, together through a fuel stop. Because we have that 50 gallon tank, we average between 11 and 12 miles per gallon. That basically means I have 500 plus miles of, of range in this truck. We don't drive five, 600 miles in a day. We try and keep things down to four hours of driving, which is around 300 miles a day. Once we get to where we're going, we unhook. I go fuel the truck while we're unhooked. So I don't have to pull this great big rig through a fuel stop. Um, I can just do it when I'm unhooked and I have plenty of range to get to where I'm going next. So yeah, the 50 gallon fuel tank, huge. All right, that's it. That's all I have. Do you have any negatives on the truck, Tony Tao? No. No, see, Tony Tao has no negatives on the truck. We really do love this Ram. Um, and and step. what's that? step into the bed. Oh yeah, there's a small step in the bed that just kind of like kicks down. That's a great little addition to it as well. So it makes it easier getting in and out of the back of the truck, which we have to do from time to time because I store the, the generator and stuff up in the front of the bed. All right, that's it. That is the skinny on our Dodge Ram 3500 crew cab, long bed, high output diesel truck. Yeah, we really do love it. And I would buy it again in a minute. Good morning, kids. Uh, it is Wednesday here in here in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we have a couple days left here. Today is kind of might be our only day to really do a lot of adventuring because we had another meeting pop up. We have uh, a client meeting on Friday, but we had one that popped up for tomorrow. So today is kind of adventure day. I found a couple things on Atlas Obscura that we're going to try and hunt down. One of them is a road, I believe it's called a Lincoln Highway, and apparently this used to be a road that went up from New York all the way to San Francisco. There is an old section of it that's still here in Omaha, so we're gonna take a look at that. And the world's largest ball of stamps. Doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> you ready to go, Gracie? Huh? You ready to go adventure? Let's go adventure. So behind me is the old Lincoln Highway. This was originally built in 1913. It went all the way from Times Square in New York to Lincoln Park in San Francisco at one point. It spanned 3,300 miles across the nation. And this is a small section of it that is still, uh, still usable here in Omaha. It's all brick. It's three miles of brick highway. It's kind of cool. We're gonna go ahead and roll down the rest of it and see what we see. So we found our way to the place that has the world's largest ball of stamps, but this might be a bust. Because it's at some place called Boys Town. I have no idea what Boys Town is. We're going to look. It's in the Leon Myers Stamp Center, which is part of the Boys Town Visitor Center. 
Well, you can go in. I'll stay here with the dog. All right, I'm going to try and sneak in with the camera and get a picture or two of the world's largest ball of stamps. Deep inside the caverns of the visitor center, bathed in the glowing illumination of LED lights, lies the world's largest ball of stamps. The gigantic ball measures in at 32 inches in diameter, weighs 600 pounds, and is estimated to have over 4 million canceled stamps. The ball started back in 1953, when a group known as the Boys Town Stamp Collecting Club started to consolidate the stamps using a golf ball as a base. The real question though is, how much of that ball is spit from licking all those stamps? Mission accomplished. Poor Tony Town Gracie did not get to see the world's largest ball of stamps. She sure. You, this is your chance. Apparently she's not as excited about a giant ball of stamps as I am.